The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. The name of this message, it doesn't sound like a Christmas message in the title, but is Following Rabbi Jesus. And we're going to cover seven great events in the life of Jesus and one great event in our lives. Event one, Luke 2, 8 through 14. The angels announced the birth of Jesus. This is a rare occurrence when the Bible says a host of angels came to give an announcement. But this was worthy of such an announcement. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. I'll save that for a minute, what this verse really means. Have you ever heard anybody ask, what does peace, goodwill to men mean? Maybe you haven't, but I have. In Luke 2, 8 through 14, we read, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men of goodwill. That's a little bit different translation. What this is actually saying is glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those who enter into the pleasure of God's will. See, we have talked about God's will before is not just an idea or a plan or a map, that God's will is a flow that contains the presence of God and the power of God to do that flows from heaven to earth. And like Abraham, it can stop being our story and we can enter into his story. That's what it means to enter into God's will. That's the way Jesus lived his life, by the way. He came and he fully entered into God's will for the entire time He was on planet earth. And at the end of that, he was able to say, it is finished. Now in the original Greek, Luke 2.14 is translated. This is the original Greek. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among whom he is pleased. Or those who enter into the good pleasure of God's will, which is his eternal plan for mankind. So there's something specific here that this verse is saying. It's not just blessing mankind in general. It's actually calling forth those who will enter into what God is doing and to them, and to them, to them it's true peace because they enter into the rest of God. The Hebrews rest, the peace of God, comes only through joining together with Him in accomplishing the Father's will. Now we who are here already know that God's eternal purpose then is clearly stated in Hebrews 2.10. It says that the mission of Jesus was to be a captain, a pioneer, a leader of our salvation to bring many sons 
back to the glory that Adam and Eve forfeited to bring them back to the glory that was lost. You see, we're not here just to be forgiven and live like the devil and do what we want to do. That we are called to take up the very same mission that Jesus took up. And to those people, there's the good pleasure of God extended. And Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 says, But God... Speaking of, but God on behalf of fallen mankind who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Messiah and raised us up together with him and made us sit together with him in the heavenly places. This is speaking of the heavenly holy of holies. The entire purpose of the book of Hebrews is an exhortation to not hang back, but follow Jesus to where he is now. And we follow him in the spirit because in the spirit where he is, we are too. But it's not just to know about it, that God wants us to enter into it. And that is his eternal purpose, to not have just a few who come into the glory of God in the Holy of Holies. But Jesus said, in my Father's house, there's room for all my children. In the heavenly Holy of Holies, there's room for all my children. And Jesus came as the captain of our salvation and cut a pathway back from leaving the glory in heaven to come to earth, cut a pathway for many sons and daughters to follow him. And by the way, I was going to get into a whole thing about why it's okay to celebrate Jesus. That was on my mind, but it was coming out to about eight pages of notes. And uh, I thought that was too long. But I want you to know that Christmas is a Christian festival. It is not a pagan festival. And even in the the German Christmas tree, the song O Tannenbaum talks about the tree that sheltered the manger. It is uh, not an expression of worshiping a tree, but that the tree, the lowly trees, the animals provided shelter for the very one who created them. Now, by the way, the date... And I had this all written out for you too. Maybe I'll do it another time. The date of December 25th. Now, anybody who's ever been to Israel in the winter knows that the winters are cold. Shepherds would not be out in the fields by night with their sheep. They would be back in shelter in the sheepfold until spring would come and the grass would be ready for the sheep to graze again. So why was September 25th chosen? Well, looking on the part of man, the Emperor Constantine, when he made Christianity acceptable as the state religion, replaced a pagan festival with a Christian festival. But actually, if you get to studying the feast, and again, it's too much for me to go in here, it is It can be calculated. Looking at the birth of John the Baptist, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth and so forth, and studying the feasts, that Jesus was perhaps conceived on December 25th, but born during the Feast of Tabernacles. God with us, Emmanuel. God who came to earth to live among his people, to bring the glory among his people, and to lead his people back to glory. The Feast of Tabernacles at the first coming. And we know that the Bible talks about the second coming being during the Feast of Tabernacles. God with us again, but this time to begin a thousand year millennial reign. So I won't go into all the feasts and the calculations and that... Zechariah's term when he would have been priest and prophesied over uh, John after John's birth and so forth. But it really is fascinating and very scriptural. However, we are celebrating Christmas on December 25th. 
So what does this mean to us or what could this mean to us? Here is a quote by Ian Paul. I don't know if you know him, but he said, as, speaking of Christmas, as the nights close in and the days shorten, we long to see the light. As the winter gets colder, we long for warmth. As nature around us seems strangled by death, we need signs of hope and life. And as the inconvenience of going out gets greater, we are more isolated from friends and neighbors and we long for, for company. Who can bring us light but the light of the world? John eight twelve. Who can bring us warmth but the one who has poured out God's love into our hearts? Romans 5, 5. Who gives us hope beyond death but the one who not only tasted death for us, but swallowed it up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. And who else can bring us into friendship with God? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Well, we know what happened to Jesus between the night the angels announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds and his adulthood. We know a few things. A few things are recorded in Scripture. What was Jesus' life like? Well, we know that next, after the angels announced that a Savior had been born, we know that wise men bearing gifts came from the east to worship, to worship Jesus, and they were following the star that was over the place where he was born. And these wise men first came to King Herod and they told him that they were seeking the king of the Jews. Well, Herod was not real thrilled that a king had been born who would maybe rival him. So he told the wise men, well, he pulled together all the wise men and scribes and the people who knew scriptures to tell the wise men where the baby was to be born according to prophecy, which was in Bethlehem. And Herod told the wise men to go find the baby and come back and tell him exactly where they found the baby. But an angel warned the wise men in a dream and they went back home to the east another way. An angel then warned Joseph in a dream, and Mary, Joseph, and Jesus fled to Egypt. And by the way, they were not destitute refugees, and they were not immigrants. Like we, they were not illegal immigrants or illegal aliens, which is the proper title. They were not breaking the law, and they were not destitute because Joseph had a business as a stonemason building houses and later Jesus was brought into that same family business where they prospered and they used limestone, local limestone and marble that was brought by ship to um, Caesarea Maritime. So what happened next after Joseph and Mary went to Egypt? And I have a few things to say about Egypt too. Herod then killed all the male children under the age of two. Horrible, horrible thing. So the Magi coming, that was event two. Event three, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus flee to Egypt. Now a little bit about Egypt. I don't know what you pictured. They didn't go stay in a um, cave in the desert when they went to Egypt. Now Egypt, as you may know, is in North Africa. Actually, the entirety, at the same time Paul was evangelizing um, to the north of Israel, the apostle John Mark and Barnabas, and at least Peter was there at least one time, went down into North Africa and they evangelized coast to coast North Africa as much of the world as Paul evangelized north of Israel. They evangelized south of Israel. And there's, fast, there's a actually a group of scholars working now, I believe in Pennsylvania, who are intensely studying the history of Christian Africa because so much was lost because when the Muslims came in and wiped out, oh, I would say a good third of the continent was Christian at that time. And a lot of, a lot of things have been lost and 
archaeologists can't get in there and dig and find the sites and the, um, verify a lot of the details archaeologically. Um, but back to the time that Mary and Joseph would have been there. Africa had served as a place of refuge for Jews for centuries. A number of African cities were particular cities of refuge for those fleeing from many countries and particularly Jews in times of war, hardship, or famine beginning in the third century BC through the first century, the time of Jesus. Most Jews tend to, tended to gravitate toward Cyrene, which is in modern day Libya, and Alexandria, Egypt. It's estimated that at least three million Jews resettled on the continent of Africa. They remained observant Jews while at the same time raising families, worshiping in synagogues. They built synagogues, sending their children to school to study Torah, building homes, learning trades, buying land, growing crops, raising livestock, trading with merchants because See, Alexandria was also a port. Cyrene was a little bit inland, but they were well familiar with the traders who came in from the sea, and they prospered in Africa. For many generations, Jews lived as permanent and prosperous residents there. Now, Alexandria and Cyrene, the two main centers, were among the most crossed cultural cities for commerce. As a result, any well-traveled Jew and those who particularly lived in these areas learned Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and Latin, as well as other languages. Now, many of these Jews were Messianic. They were looking for a Messiah to come. They were ripe to be evangelized when the apostle Mark travel south. And by the way, if you look at your map, Paul's journeys were a little more arduous. It was an easy journey to travel from Jerusalem or Bethlehem, Bethlehem down the Via Maris, the Roman road, the well-built, well-constructed Roman road that was so popular that hugged the seacoast going down into, into Africa. Now, Later, in the first century, Alexandria and Cyrene became great centers for Christian scholarship. They were already great centers for scholarship, scholarship, but now they became great centers for Christian scholarship. From the first through the sixth century, a world-renowned Christian university was established in Alexandria, Egypt, and it was from here that the Old Testament was translated into Greek, as we know the Septuagint. Now, when Joseph and Mary fled with Jesus, it's believed that they were welcomed into the homes of relatives and friends on their way. They did not sleep in a cave. They did not sleep in a tent. They, they were housed by people, Jews, who were already settled in Egypt. And by the way, it's only 40 miles from Bethlehem to Egyptian territory. Now, if you're going to go all the way to Alexandria, it's another 260 miles. But they would not have had to go far before they were safe. And actually, if they had gone by sea, they could have been all the way to Alexandria and even all the way to Cyrene in just a few weeks' time. Now, event three, Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt. Now, the next event on my list, I have event five because there's a missing event we're going to talk about. Event five in the Bible, the next thing we learn about in the Bible was when Jesus was 12 years old. Luke 2, 41 through 52 Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem. This was after they moved back from Egypt. Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. 
When they had finished the days, as, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother didn't know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when Mary and Joseph saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know, Mary, that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. What was his father's business? His father's eternal purpose. But it was not yet time for Jesus to begin his life's work. Verse 51 of Luke 2 says, Then he went down with Joseph and Mary and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. He was a good child. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in broad and full understanding and stature and in favor with God and men. So if this was event five, what would event four be? It was the education of Jesus. It was life and what life was like in the region around the Sea of Galilee. It might surprise you, not those of you who grew up on a farm. Anybody in here grew up on a farm? Okay, well, you know this that the children work, that there are always chores to be done. There's always work to be done. So the children will get up early and feed the horses or do whatever, the early morning chores, usually before dawn. And then if they're going to school, they'll go to school and they'll come back in the afternoon. They'll work. It's not like when I was growing up and we had all sorts of leisure time to hang out with our friends in the neighborhood. And it would have been the same in Galilee. Just think about this. Ladies, well, for one thing, Vicki said when she was on the mission field, if they wanted a sandwich, they had to make bread. If they wanted ketchup on that sandwich, they had to make ketchup. So you really could spend most of the day preparing for an evening meal. Well, life in the first century was just like that. You'd have to go, you didn't have a refrigerator. You'd have to regularly go to market and buy meat, fish, foods, produce, greens, vegetables. How do you suppose that long they lasted? Maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks. Vicki said that when she went to the mission compound to get vegetables, they were pretty brown and wilted by the time they got there. So I suspect you could make do with some wilted brown vegetables, but I suspect that these housewives, knowing they could go to market or send somebody to market for them, um, would go to market on a regular basis and then bring it home. And again, if they wanted bread, guess what you have to do? You have to grind the grain and then do the rest of it. So um, what would Jesus have done as a typical Jewish boy living in Galilee? It may surprise you to learn, although there's some Bible verses that express some bias toward Galileans, it may surprise you to learn that the people of Galilee were perhaps the most religious Jews in the land of Israel. Wow, I thought everything good in Israel happened in Jerusalem myself. But in Galilee, I know it's pretty, but hey, that's a pretty bold statement. Now it is true that the priests and Pharisees, the people who had work concerning the temple, were in Jerusalem. But the people there lived in a more mountainous uh, land and they would have been more scattered. And they would not necessarily have adopted the attitude 
of the, the Levites and the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes. Now here's a verse that talks about the common view of the Galileans. Acts 4.13. When the religious leaders saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished. Now this sounds like they were illiterate, doesn't it? That they had no learning. Well, when you think about our school system today, you might consider somebody who's um, just gone to school through the ninth grade, unschooled for the most part. They certainly haven't gone on to college and certainly not to graduate school. They might not have any degree at all, but it doesn't mean that they were illiterate. The Galilean people, now this may surprise you, I just love doing research when I find things. <laughs> the Galilean people were actually more educated in the Torah than most of the other Jews. Does that surprise you? I want to tell you, in the past oh, I, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, what they're discovering, it, what the archaeologists are discovering is absolutely amazing. Back in 86, a book came out that was the standard that everybody quoted. It was by W.V. Harris, and it was Ancient Literacy. And he made some statements, and he backed it up with some things, but ignored some other things. He made some statements that in the ancient world, where our first and second century Jews and Christians would have lived, there was widespread illiteracy and maybe 1% of the population could read and write. That has been blown to smithereens in the recent years. Well, first of all, I thought the Romans were a pretty civilized people, and they did a lot of construction, and they had an organized army, and surely they taught the children to read and write. Well, it was found in the late 70s, in archaeological digs, letters from common soldiers, uh, lists that they had made, um, war strategies, letters from their wives, letters to their children. And it, from, the, from the least to the greatest in the army, they could read and write. And it just blew, the literacy rate in Rome was, it just blew the old scholarship away. And then you think about Greece. What did they prize? They prized learning. Remember, that was the problem when Paul went there. With all your gods and all your, all your uh, philosophizing and all that, it's made you so you can't understand the simplicity of the good news of Jesus. That's what it's done. It's hardened your hearts and certainly hardened your heads. The Greeks took scholarship even more seriously than the Romans. And it was common for households to hire tutors to come in and teach a group of children how to read and write, even the girls. Even the girls. So let's get back to Galilee. So um, the more, okay, listen to this. More famous Jewish teachers came from Galilee than anywhere else. Does that give you a hint about the type of schooling that was available there. They were known for their great reverence for scripture and passionate desire to be faithful to it, to live it out. They had vibrant religious communities with synagogues that resounded, they were filled with lively debate and discussions about Torah. Understanding this helps us to understand the great faith and courage of these Galilean men that Jesus called to be his followers. It explains why they were so willing to follow him and so willing to spread the good news after he had ascended to heaven. You see, God in his wisdom had prepared an environment carefully so that Jesus would be prepared for his mission later in life. Now let me explain to you a little bit about education in Galilee. Schools here were connected with the local synagogues. So you would have a community 
and there they would have a local synagogue. Each community would hire a teacher for a school. Respectfully, they would call the teacher rabbi, even though he would have no specific function in the synagogue itself. Both boys and girls began their studies at ages four to five. It was called Beth Sefer. This was their elementary school, and they learned Torah as well as reading and writing. I believe they were much more disciplined than the children of today because they would get up, they would have prayers, they would go to school, and they would come home and they would work. They were disciplined. When this level of education was finished, most students, and certainly girls, stayed home and boys learned to trade. But they would have continued in this schooling until age 12. What did Jesus do at age 12? It was the equivalent of a bar mitzvah, when a boy would be considered a man. So, after this time, they would stay home, but what would they do in addition to staying home? They didn't play, they didn't socialize. The boys would learn a trade and the girls would learn how to run a household. She'd learn to cook, she'd learn to make clothes, she'd learn um, whatever chores she would needed to do, probably some sewing and um, other things. But she would have to be prepared to run a household. See, that, that day, people lived in households called insula, an insula with many buildings grouped together as for family and extended family. Okay, so the boys would learn a trade. Now, what did Joseph do? He was a stonemason. It's called tecton, translated in our Bibles as carpenter, but it actually means tecton is a carpenter who builds. This is a house builder. When Jesus talked about a house being built on a rock, he knew what he was talking about. When he talked about building with living stones, he spoke out of the trade that he did. See, they had a family business, and Jesus and his brothers worked in the family business. As a matter of fact, they were capitalists. They were small businessmen. Jesus was not impoverished. He was not destitute. You have to have good business practices. You have to know how to deal with artisans and people who do mosaics. And um, even if there were a lot of poorer homes, there were a lot of wealthy Jews. And also they would be used in, for example, the city of Sepphoris, which was about three miles away from Nazareth, where the Romans came in and did some fabulous buildings, only three miles away. And who would they call upon, do you think? Local craftsmen, local house builders. They might import materials, and they would also have to learn to have good people skills to deal with the other workers who would be supporting their business. Now, because the Torah was housed in the synagogues, Ordinary people had to go to the synagogue to read the Torah, right? But they could go there. They could study it. They could read it for themselves. It was common for people to go there and look at scriptures and pour over the scroll in the synagogue. The ability to read and write was common. And I haven't counted these up, but why do you think, has it ever, did you ever think why Jesus said so many times, have you not read what David did? Matthew 12, 3, Mark 2, 25, he said to them, have you never read what David did? Luke 6, 3, Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this? Matthew 12, 5, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests do such and such? Matthew 19, 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning? Matthew 21, 16, and Jesus said to him, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have perfected 
praise. Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Mark 12, 10, have you not even read the scripture of the same scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Matthew 21, 31, and concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? And Mark 12, 26, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read? Changes your perception of what first century Israel must have been like. They were illiterate people. And on the Sabbath, a person in attendance could come up and read from the Torah themselves. Just like Jesus did in Luke 4, the synagogue in Capernaum. Okay, let's get back to the school life. After finishing uh, the first part of their ed education, the Beth Sefer Elementary School, the best students continued school, but then they would work on their trade later in the day. In Beth Midrash, which is secondary school, a few of the best Beth Midrash students sought permission after this to study with one of the famous rabbis, often leaving home to travel with him for a long period of time. And these students, Talmud in the singular, Talmudim in the plural, set out to become not just knowing the information taught by the rabbi, they wanted to become like the man their rabbi was. They wanted to have the heart attitudes of the rabbi. They wanted to think like the rabbi. They wanted to follow the Torah like the rabbi. Now, Talmudim means disciple. The rabbi Talmudim relationship was a very intense and personal system of education. Now, the most sought out, the most famous, the most learned, the most holy of the rabbis occasionally asked a disciple to follow them. Usually the disciples sought out who they wanted to study with, but in special cases, a rabbi would say, you, Gwen, come with me. And you know, our Jesus discipled women as well as men, although the 12 were all men. Most of the teachers, most of the rabbis were what would be known as Torah teachers, teachers of the law who could only teach already accepted interpretations of scripture. But there were some few known as rabbis with authority. Smika, rabbis with authority who could come up with new interpretations of the scripture, deeper interpretations of the scripture. The crowds were amazed because Jesus taught with this kind of authority and not as their Torah teachers. Matthew 7, 29, Jesus taught them as one having authority, and that word is exousia in the Greek, and not as the scribes. Now, so that was event four. That was what Jesus' childhood was like. He didn't go off to some strange land like some ridiculous books and pseudo-scholars have claimed. He was learning the Torah and he was living in community and he was learning the trade of a stonemason. Event six then. Jesus began 
his public ministry. And we know about that day because that was the day he stood up in the synagogue and read from the scroll of the book on a Sabbath. Luke 4, 16 through 22, Jesus gave his mission statement. So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, everybody knew who Jesus was and they knew Jesus' family. They knew his father was Joseph the Tecton. He stood up to read and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are, who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He was announcing that he was the Messiah. And of course, we know what happened after that, that the, the religious folk gnashed their teeth and they rushed out of the synagogue and there's a Mount Precipice outside the synagogue and they were going to push him over, the, over a cliff and kill him. But it says, Jesus submitted himself to the will of his Father. See, when you're in God's will and it's not God's will for you, no one can touch you. He was submitted to the will of his Father and he walked. He didn't run. He walked right through the crowd. So Jesus began his ministry. And one of the first things he did was Jesus began calling Talmudim to come and follow him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus specifically called 12 men to follow him. Down through the centuries, Jesus has continued to call disciples to follow him. And now he's called each one of us. We didn't seek him. He sought us. What an honor. What a privilege. We were lost. We Following Jesus was the furthest thing through from our minds. And he touched our hearts and said, follow me. So the point is, may we be faithful to the call and follow the captain of our salvation all the way back to the glory, all the way to the heavenly holy of holies and the glory of his presence. I suggest you read the book of Hebrews. And I like it starting in about chapter 10 because the first chapters tell us why we should go all the way to the heavenly holy of holies. But beginning in chapter 10, Hebrews 10, 19 through 23, therefore, brothers and sisters, fellow followers of Jesus, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, who is Jesus, our heavenly Melchizedek. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Let us be faithful too. Let's make a fresh consecration this Christmas that we will follow 
our Rabbi Jesus, that we will go with him as he still continues through us to fulfill the mission that his father gave him. And now that mission is passed down to us. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.